everyone i hope you're doing well today um i'm just carrying on where i left off at chapter 10. the Manus museum of natural history was very quiet this weekday morning the boy who slept the floors was outside weeding the flower beds the porter dozed in his cubicle and there were no visitors but in his lab behind the office professor glastonbury was worrying about the giant sloth he often worried about the giant sloth for the past year, he'd been putting the, mo the skeleton of the great beast together and it was going to make a most impressive exhibit. At least it should have done. For the truth was the skeleton was not complete. It was nearly complete, but not quite. One rib was missing, the third rib on the left hand side. Professor Gas Glastonbury had made a false rib out of plaster of Paris and now he fitted it carefully into the breastbone and it looked fine. At least, if you didn't know. The trouble was that the professor did know. He stood looking at his handiwork. The sloth was on his metal stands, seemed to fill the whole room. He took the rib out. He put it in again. He sighed. A false rib was cheating, but a missing rib was untidy. At that moment, he heard the creaking of the revolving doors and peering out, realised that two people had come into the museum whom he recognised. The tall, thin woman who had been interested in Bernard Tavener's collection and the schoolgirl who had been with her. A girl with a lot of dark hair and intelligent eyes. He came out of his office and said, Good morning. The tall woman smiled and at once looked less alarming. This is Maya, she said. She has come to make some drawings of a bird's wings. May I leave her here to work with you on her own? I'll fetch her at three o'clock. I don't think she'll be any trouble. I'm sure she won't, said the professor. He was still holding the false rib and looked distracted. What a large rib, said Miss Minton. Yes, he took a deep breath and poured out the problem of the missing bone. No one would know it was not the real one, he said. Miss Minton looked severe. You would know, she said. The professor sighed. That's what Taverner used to say. May we see it? The sloth, asked Maya. Certainly. He led them through his office and into the lab. It's not upside down, said Maya. I thought sloths always hung from trees, not the giant sloths. They'd have splintered any tree they tried to hang from. This one would have weighed about three tons when it was alive, but they've been extinct for a thousand years. Once again, the professor put the rib in and once again, he took it out. What do you think? I think we should go and find the missing bone, said Miss Minton. The professor stared at her. Was she serious? Surely not. I'm afraid that's impossible, he said. The original skeleton came from a cave near the Zanti River, miles away to the north, and I'm too old for expeditions. Nonsense, said Miss Minton. Anyone who can walk can, can go on expeditions. Then she took her leave and Maya said good morning to the stuffed pe Pekingese before she settled down at the table near the birds in flight ex exhibit and began to draw. It was good to be in the museum again and away from the carters. Not just the Pekingese, but the Amazonian river slug, the lumpy man manty, manatee, <laughs> the shrunken head, all seemed like old friends. And of course, the Taverner collection, which she now saw with her own eyes. And as she drew, as she drew, Maya tried to puzzle out the problem of her governess. Maya had told Miss Minton that Clovis was safe with the Indian boy. Miss Minton had nodded, but she had asked no more questions. It was strange how little she asked Maya about her comings and goings. When she pounced on every strand of unbrushed hair or a fingernail not scrubbed to cleanliness. Then when Maya said she needed to go and work in the museum to finish her project on birds of the rainforest, Minty had done no more than raise an eyebrow and had gone about arranging it. She had even persuaded Mrs Carter to let them go down on the rubber boat so as to give them more time in Manus. And why did Finn want to know Miss Minton's Christian name? But she wasn't in the museum to think about Minty, or even draw, to draw the birds. She was here to do a job for Finn. And when she was sure the museum was empty, she walked over to the door marked private and knocked. Professor Glastonbury came out at once. He really was a very nice man with his round pink face and white fringe of hair. I'm sorry to disturb you again, said Maya, but I have a message for you and she handed him the note that Finn had written in the hut. The professor read it and looked at it, looked at her intently. So she had found Finn and made friends with him. Not only that, but she wanted to help him. Yes, he said, I see. You're a messenger and to be trusted. Come in. 
He led her into his office and locked the door. Maya had never seen such a room. There wasn't a centimetre that wasn't covered in something. Limb casts, snake skins, jumbled bones, and books everywhere, even on the floor. But it was a friendly clutter, not like the mess in Mr Carter's room. Sit down, he said, and moved a stuffed marmoset from a rickety chair. Then he read the note again. I don't see why not. If it's just for one night. No, I really don't see why not. He said you knew a good hiding place. He said you showed it to him. Professor Glastonbury smiled. He must have been close on 60, but he looked like a pleased pink baby. Ah, he remembered, did he? Well, come along. If Finn says you're to be trusted, I'm sure he's right. He took her into the lab and for the second time, Maya was led to the giant sloth. But this time, the professor put his shoulder to the heavy metal stand, which moved slowly to one side. On the wooden floor, grimed with dirt, Maya could just make out a square of darker colour wood and an iron ring. It's a trap door, he said. Goes down to a cellar and a storeroom, but it's well ventilated. Got one high window. Best hiding place in Manus, we used to say. Finn liked to play down there when he was little, while his father helped me. Maya stood looking at the flight of steps which led into the darkness. Would you like to go down there? The professor asked. May I? Of course, but you'd better have a light. There's no electricity down there. He bought her a hurricane lamp and she climbed down. The cellar was huge and vaulted, with a recess at the back full of packaging cases. Between the cases were exhibits, which the professor had not any room for, or those waiting to be repaired. A beam of light fell on the red eyes of a moth-eaten puma. There were unstring bows and painted shields, and a harpy eagle sitting on a lopsided nest. In a corner was a heap of round objects which might have been carved coconuts, but might have been shrunken heads. But the floor was dry, and in the far end of the room the high window gave a glimmer of light. It's marvellous, said Maya, coming up again. No one could find you unless they knew. The professor moved the stand back over the trap door. I sometimes store Billy down there when when the trustees come on an inspection. They don't approve of stuffed Pekingese in a serious museum. There's just one more thing, said Maya, as the professor led her out of the lab. Finn thought that we should, that I should, steal the spare keys so that no one gets into trouble. You, your staff or you if anything goes wrong. I doubt if anyone could do much to me, said Professor Glastonbury. But it's true. It wouldn't. I wouldn't want my cleaners or my caretaker blamed. The trouble is, said Maya, looking up at him, I haven't actually stolen anything before. There is always a first time, said the professor cheerfully. The spare keys are hanging out on that hook over there, and I'm going out in half an hour to have my lunch. There she is, said Mr Trapwood, looking out of the window on the pension Maria at the slender blue funnel of HMS Bishop, the sister ship of the Cardinal, which had just come into port. She would spend four days on the turnabout while the crew cleaned the ship, took, out, took on supplies and had some time ashore. Then, on Saturday morning, she would set off again to the mouth of the Amazon, across the Atlantic and back to Britain. The crows had been so sure of finding Tavener's son that they had booked a three-berth cabin for the return journey, but they were beginning to give up hope, for it was clear that the wretched boy was deliberating hiding from them. At first, people had tried to deny that Tavener had a son at all. Now, though, they were beginning to laugh behind their sleeves, and as the day for the detective's departure grew closer, there were sly digs about the boy having outwitted them. But why? The crows were hurt. They had come as bearers of good tidings to bring a savage jungle boy the new news of his inheritance. They had been prepared to introduce him gradually to polite society, perhaps on the journey to teach him to use a knife and fork. Sir Aubrey had even given them some money to buy him clothes, in case he had been brought up in a grass skirt, and they had expected gratitude. It was only natural. Thank you, Mr. Lowe, the boy would have said, grasping them by the hand. And thank you, Mr. Trapwood. You have saved me from a life of toil and darkness. Instead of that, the boy was deliberating hiding and everyone in Manu seemed to be helping him. We've got three days m m more, said Mr. Trapwood. There's still a chance to flush him out. To carry him abroad by force is, n if necessary, to get the bonus from Sir Aubrey. 
Doubt was the most important thing of all. Sir Aubrey had promised them a hundred pounds each if they brought his grandson safely home. I still think there was something fishy about that pigtail girl at the Carter's place. Miss Slow agreed. She had a shifty look. We'll have to keep an eye on her. The crows were looking very much the worse for wear. Their black suits were dusty and torn. The maid at the Pension Maria had burnt every one of their shirts as she ironed them. Mr Trapwood's face was covered in lumps where the bites of the tabernid fly had gone septic. And both their stomachs had become boiling caverns of agony and wind. But we can still do it, said Trapwood, punching the table. We'll try down river this time. Those houses by the fishing place. The people there look poor enough. They should take some notice of the reward. Mr Lowe nodded and made his way stealthily towards the door. If you're thinking of getting to the lavatory before me, don't try, said Trapwood. I'm going first. No, you aren't. I need it. You need it. Shoving and jostling, the two detectives raced each other down the corridor. Corridor? <laughs> Professor Glastonbury made his way up the hill to the cafe, where he usually had his lunch, stopped, as he always did, by the bookshop in the square. It was run by a man who brought in his books from all over Brazil, specialising in books about natural history. In the window was a copy of Travels in the Amazon by Alfred Russell Wallace, open at a beautiful woodcut of an Indian village. He was admiring it when he realised that the tall, straight, black woman, backed woman, who was also staring into the window, was the lady who had left Maria in the museum. A beautiful book, she said, raising his hat. She sighed. Yes, quite above my means, I fear. It's not a first edition, he said. You might get it quite reasonably. I know the owner. Perhaps he'll put it aside for a while. Thank you, but... Would you have to put it aside for most of my life? My salary is not princely, even when it is paid. Both of them looked for a while longer at the book. Then Miss Minton gave her tight-lipped smile. I was dismissed once for reading, she said. Really? The professor waited, but she said no more. I left Maya working hard, he went on. The caretaker promised to keep an eye on her. Did she know what Maya was really doing in the museum, he wondered? Probably not. Yet yeah, she didn't look like a person easily to hoodwink. As she bent down to pick up the basket with Mrs Carter's shopping, he said, Allow me. She shook her head. Thank you, but it's not heavy. They began to walk towards the main street with its cafes and shops. I've been thinking about what you said. About the missing bone. Of Margaritium. The sloth, I mean. You have decided to go and look for it? No, no. But Tavener was also against putting in a false robe. He was a good naturalist and a good man. I miss him. Yes, I can imagine that. Was it he who found the skeleton? No, it was found many years ago. It went to a museum in Rio, too important for my little place, but no one had any time to assemble it, so they sent it down to me. But Tavener knew the place it came from. Not only that, he broke off. His wife came from up there, he went on. It's practically un an unexplored country. Did you know his wife? Yes, she was beautiful and gentle. She died in childbirth because the English doctor wouldn't come out to an Indian girl at night. As you can imagine, it didn't make Tavener any more anxious to return to England. They walked on for a while without speaking. Then the professor, blushing a little, for only he was very shy, asked Miss Minton if she would care to join him for lunch. It's only a little local cafe, but the food is good. But as he had expected, she refused. Thank you. I have some sandwiches. But at the door of the cafe, Miss Minton was overcome suddenly by the glorious smell of real strong Brazilian coffee. Perhaps a cup of coffee, she said. It was a nice cafe, friendly and cheap, and it cost Miss Minton some efforts not to allow the professor to buy her a dish of chicken and rice. I lunch here most days, he said, since my wife died. Was that a long time ago? Yes, ten years now. I blame myself. The climate didn't suit her. I should have taken her back to England. Miss Minton frowned. She did not approve of people blaming themselves for what was done. Are the calves difficult to reach? The one where your sloth came from, she asked. Yes. Difficult, but not impossible. Did Tavener think there were more remains there? More bones? He thought there might be, but that's neither here nor there. I shall be 58 next year. An old man. That is kind 
But that is the kind of remark I don't enjoy, said Miss Minnie cuttingly, and picked up her cup of coffee. Okay, that is all I'm reading today. I hope you guys have enjoyed. Um, yeah, bye.